was setting up. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's so nice to be here. Uh, Dr. Boyle and I are going to be giving a talk on movement disorders. Uh, you know, I think this talk is really dedicated to all the patients and families that have taught us movement disorder along the way. We actually train together. Uh, Dr. Boyle is an adult movement disorder specialist, and I'm a pediatric movement specialist. And one of the things we realized really early on was that it's often really scary for families to make that transition to see, be able to see, um, you know, go from pediatrics to adult providers. And so I think one of the fun things we were able to do when we worked together was for a lot of these families, when we were talking about options uh, from a movement disorder perspective, they knew that we were on the same page. And so that transition uh, was a lot easier for them. Um, but we've learned a lot along the way. Um, and so, like I said, this talk is really a dedication to all the families that have taught us. Um, and so we'll get started. So these are disclosures. We don't have any. Um, I do have some funding project, uh, funding for the BPAN project. So just to outline, we're going to be doing an introduction to various types of movement disorders that are seen in NBIA. I think dystonia is the one that, you know, often can be most frustrating, and I'll tr we'll try to do our best to sh um, let you know what our current understanding of dystonia is, and then also review current um, management options. So just to begin, movement disorders are a group of uh, CNS disorders. Um, you know, typically in movement disorders, you have a preservation of strength oftentimes, um, sometimes muscle bulk, and we'll talk a little bit about some of these differences. We're talking about movement disorders in general at this point. What we see in movement disorders, though, is that there, there's changes in muscle tone, the way you're able to initiate uh, movement, and the speed and the smoothness of voluntary movements is often impaired. And oftentimes you can also have the occurrence of involuntary movements as well. And so this really helps us to be able to understand different types of movement disorders and to help to categorize it in different ways that we'll try to explain um, in the next few slides. So first when we talk about movement disorders, we try to talk about the localization. So where does this come from? You know, people come to us and they say, is this my muscles? Is this my brain? So for the most part, the pathology is in the basal ganglia. So the deep nuclei within the brain is where the signal comes out. You also can have difficulty with the cerebellum, the back part of the brain, the thalamus, that internal relay station, or the pyramidal tracts, which bring the signal from the brain all the way down to the muscles. So the pyramidal tract, if you have a problem with this, you see typical signs of what we call classic upper motor neuron. When you think of a person that's had a stroke, when you see them walking, they kind of have their arm up and their leg out, and that's spastic tone, and that comes from the pyramidal tract, that, that relay station that comes from the top of the brain all the way down to your muscles. The basal ganglia is this internal part which causes a lot of movement problems, and so when we have difficulty with this, we mostly see bradykinesia, which is a slowness of movement, and rigidity, which is a stiffness. A little different than spasticity from a stroke, it's more rigid like with Parkinson's. So those are the types of movements we see with basal ganglia. And then in the cerebellum, which is the back part of the brain, this is the part that kind of keeps you level and helps you have that smooth pursuit. So if something's wrong in the cerebellum, that back part, you're going to have difficulty with balance, you'll be uncoordinated, and very irregular ataxic movements. So for the movement categories, we try to divide them into different groups in order to be able to say what kind of movement they are. So there's four main groups. So the first one is hyperkinetic. This means too much movement. And we normally don't think that that's a problem. But if we're moving too much, some people get to certain movements that's too much and they can fall and it's just, it can get bothersome. So that one's an excess of movement. Hypokinetic, which is too little movement, causes a poverty of movement. So that's like when people are very slow with Parkinson's, they're slow and stiff. Uh, it's just too little movement. And then we can have ataxia, which is just a general term for unbalanced, so without order. You're just kind of all over the place. And then you can have abnormal tone or posture. So these are the ones that we're going to kind of focus a little bit more on today, where we have spasticity, which we talked about is from like a stroke type of tone, and then you have dystonia, 
which is a fixed muscle movement. We'll get more into that. And then there's rigidity where it's stiffness, a different kind of stiffness. So we have to look at all three of these. And the best way to really figure out what type of movement or tone you have is just by feeling people and moving them. And then we treat based off of what the actual problem is. So when we talk about the abnormal movement categories, we have the hypokinesia or akinesia, which is too little movement or no movement. So that's when we see slowness and stiffness. It's due to an inhibition of the motor cortex, the top part of your brain by the thalamus. It just cuts off that signal and you can't move correctly. People want to move, but they just can't. And then we have hyperkinesia, which is due to disinhibition of the thalamus, which is just too much signal. And people have extra movements. They move around a lot. They have dance-like movements. They can have dystonia where they have too much movement. And I highlighted some of the things that we often see um, with some of the hyperkinetic movements. Uh, chorea, acetosis may be words that uh, you may have heard about or seen in your loved ones and dystonia. Um, you know, a lot of these entities can look very similar. Um, and I think that the trouble with some of these movements is sometimes it may be all happening at the same time, too. So, um, you know, sometimes we try to isolate and understand these movements a little bit um, better in order to see which one is the more prominent movement. But there are many patients that we see that over time, they may have several different movement uh, disorders coming together, especially in the hyperkinetic. So when we talk about tone, we're going to kind of get down to a little bit more specific. So tone is the tension in the relaxed muscle, the resistance to passive stretch. What does that mean? That means, so spasticity is hypertone due to a hyper-excitable hyper tonic stretch reflexes. It means when you go to move something, you just are fighting against this tone. So we, this is spasticity from a stroke, and we call it hyperreflexic. When we hit those reflexes, it's too much movement, um, and you see just you know, this extra tone. So when you move that tone, you can move it really slowly and it will relax, but if you go to move it fast, it catches. And so that's part of the way we distinguish spastic tone from rigid tone or dystonic tone. So then dystonia is an involuntary sustained or intermittent muscle contraction causing a twisting or abnormal posture. So whereas spastic tone kind of happens when you're moving, dystonic tone can kind of just happen when you're sitting there and it stays for a while. So people we see, they have you know, cervical dystonia, their neck turns or their arms twist, and it's just pretty a constant movement. Um, and then there's rigid tone, which is not dependent on speed or posture. So whenever you pull somebody's arm or move somebody's arm, if you, no matter how slow or fast you pull it, it's gonna be tight no matter what you do. And then there are other factors that are gonna contribute to the tone. You know, is it cold outside? Is it hot outside? Are you having a bad day? Are you not feeling well? So all of those things are gonna make the tone a little bit worse when we're checking people. And I think this slide is particularly important because even as uh, trainees um, and you know, with physicians that you'll meet, sometimes people refer to everything as spasticity or everything as tightness. And I think that's often something that's important to ask your physician because there are different types of tightness. Dystonia is very different from spasticity. And sometimes it gets lumped together in one category, but really it's two different entities and it's important to understand how much of each is contributing to someone's symptoms. And then the other thing I just wanted to point out too from a tone perspective is oftentimes um, you know, early on, you can also have hypotonia or decreased tone, right? And so we can have patients that may have decreased tone in certain areas, for example, their head and neck or their trunk, but have increased tone in their extremities. And so that can also be really frustrating, um, you know, as families trying to take care and loved ones that have this, um, especially when you're trying to figure out the right medicines that target exactly where you're trying to, to help the problem. So speaking a little bit about dystonia, oftentimes when you think about dystonia, it can be a little bit long, uh, longer in duration compared to some of the other movements we see like chorea or myoclonus. And oftentimes, the muscles are simultaneously contracting. So your agonist and antagonist muscles, which should be working in synchrony, meaning they know when one type of group of muscles is being activated, the other ones relax. All of these muscles are being activated at the same time. And so you can 
um, as a result, see a lot of twisting um, of different uh, body parts. And, um, you know, oftentimes the more severe forms, and I know for a lot of families, as, um, you know, things progress, um, words like dystonic storm um, can be really dystonia that continues for long periods of time, and you also see autonomic uh, dysfunction that's associated with it as well. And, you know, for, for those uh, patients, it's really important to try to manage it aggressively um, and to try to help um, as soon as possible. But with dystonia, one of the important things to keep in mind is how it impacts our body. So, you know, Dr. Uh, Boyle alluded to uh, torticollis or cervical dystonia, where you have, um, you know, this involuntary contraction of your neck muscles, for example. And so you'll see kind of different postures that someone can have. Um, and, you know, the other areas that you can see some of these problems um, is with dysarthria or problems with articulation or dysphagia with the ability to be able to swallow. And we know that this is related to the way that, you know, the, the muscles are not moving the way they should. So in the mouth and throat, um, for example. And it, you also see as a byproduct some of the issues related to drooling or tongue biting um, that the dystonia can cause. Um, so just important to kind of keep in mind that dystonia can be focal, so in certain parts of the body, and then it can be more generalized as well. It can happen at rest, um, but it can also happen when you're trying to activate or move your body. Um, and so, you know, like I said, for that reason, dystonia can be very tricky at times uh, to, to address and treat. I think, you know, the way that I think about dystonia is really that it's a circuit disorder. So oftentimes people will ask me, tell me where this dystonia is coming from. And I tell them, there's not really a particular spot in the brain that I can tell you it's exactly this spot where this dystonia is coming from. We know that our brain is very complex and there's lots of networks and pathways. And so what we really understand, the more we know, the more we realize we don't understand about the brain. But I think we're understanding more and more that dystonia is a circuit disorder, meaning there are pathways that are connections to different parts of our brain. And it's those connections at some point where there's disruptions or problems. And as a result of that problem, you have dystonia. So that's why it's not a one spot, it's multiple areas that potentially can be involved and the end result is the dystonia that you see. And so here we just highlighted two pathways um, that seem to be very involved in dystonia. And we'll talk about these pathways and some treatment options uh, that people are looking for in the future. So for dystonia, we talk about, you know, there are pathways that are the problem, but with those pathways come neurotransmitters, and these are really important to relay the, the signal from the brain to the muscle. And so some of the neurotransmitters that are involved with dystonia, which relates to how we end up trying to treat it, is these three main ones. So we have GABAergic, which is inhibitory in the brain and spinal cord, so this makes the signal stop. So if the muscle is supposed to contract, you get GABA to come in and to make it stop, and if it doesn't stop, then you have the muscle spasm continue. And then we have the cholinergic neurotransmitter. This one is interneurons, and it's the source of acetylcholine to medium spiny neurons in the striatum. So these are just, you know, the cholinergic fire, and they're supposed to make the muscle contract, and then it's supposed to stop. So then we also have the dopaminergic, and these are really important because we have dopamine precursors and dopamine depleters, and do you have too much dopamine or do you have too little dopamine? And that's the whole beauty of trying to figure out the movement disorder, you know, is it too much dopamine, is it too little dopamine? And that helps us try and figure out how to treat it. Do we give dopamine or do we give blockers to dopamine? And so in our, in our line of movement disorders, we actually do both. And so it's important for us to try and really pinpoint which neurotransmitter is overacting or underacting so that we can treat the movement disorder properly and have things kind of calm down for people. So, so we're starting to get the, sort of into treatment for this stuff. So for medications for dystonia, we talk about the neurotransmitters, so then the medications tend to help us either block or you know, increase that neurotransmitter. So the main medications we have for dystonia, 
The first one is oral baclofen, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. It's oral or intrathecal, and this is a GABA B agonist in the brain and spinal cord, so it helps to cut off that signal. So the signal just keeps going, baclofen comes in and cuts it off to make that muscle relax. The other medications that we use are benzodiazepines. This one is also GABA-related, so it's a GABA-A receptor. Clonazepam, diazepam, lorazepam, all of the PAMs, we love them. They help, they really work, and usually people who have dystonia need a good dose of these. We also use gabapentin, which is an analog of gamma and the butric acid. So it neither acts as GABA agonist or antagonist. So sometimes this helps with the pain. We use gabapentin a lot for neuropathy because it helps to kind of cut off that pain signal. And so, so sometimes this is also helpful for painful dystonia. And then another one that we use that's kind of different is with clonidine, which is alpha adrenergic agonist. And so this, we use these mostly for the dystonic storm to kind of help with all the autonomic things that go along with the dystonia. So to help with the heart rate and all of those other things and also to help the tone. And this is seen more in a PICU or an ICU type of a setting. I think one key thing w when you think about the GABA receptors and using medications that target the GABA receptor is really the side effects, right? So the biggest side effect of these medicines is sleepiness, sedation. And so a lot of times, because this is a systemic medication, we're trying to balance the benefit from calming our nervous system down without having the side effects which typically happen, which is we don't want our loved ones to be sedated and sleeping all the time. And so it is a little bit of a balancing act of finding the right doses where you're comfortable, but you're not sedated. So continuing on with the medications, one of the other ones that we use a lot is trihexyphenidyl or artane. So this one blocks the cholinergic receptors, so it helps to help with the muscle activation and to help to deactivate the muscle. And then we also use a lot of benzodiazepine or cogentin, which is another cholinergic receptor. It helps to reduce the muscle tone and helps relax muscle. Um, these also can cause sleepiness. In order to try and do more targeted approach and to limit the systemic side effects that we see with these medications, we use a lot of Botox or botulinum toxin or one of the toxins. There are a couple. And we use those. Those inhibit the release of acetylcholine at the receptor. So as that muscle tries to fire, it kind of blocks it so it can't fire. And it's really nice because it's, a, it's just a very specific treatment. It doesn't go systemic and it doesn't have a lot of systemic side effects. Um, it does have its own side effects which can cause some weakness and so there's a balance of trying to decrease the bad tone and making sure that good tone is still there so people can function. Another one that we use a lot is levodopa. So this is a dopamine precursor. So this helps a lot with people who are dopamine responsive and it just helps that, that muscle tone in certain types of tone. And then we have a couple of other ones that are kind of old and new, this tetrabenazine, dutetrabenazine, and valbenazine. These all work to kind of inhibit dopamine. So if people are having too much movement or that hyperkinetic state, this helps to decrease the movement to help decrease the tone. So all these guys work in those different receptors that we talked about in the brain, in the circuit to try at some point in the circuit to disrupt that bad tone. So I think when we're also thinking about next steps, so you've got the medications that you can possibly use. I know for a lot of families, there's surgical options that may be discussed. And so we wanted to kind of highlight what some of those options are. So ITB or intrathecal baclofen pump is just a different way to deliver uh, baclofen. Oral baclofen tends to, again, side, from a side effect uh, standpoint, tends to be very sedating. You can usually not get patients on the doses that you would ideally want them to be on because you end up reaching the side effect problems um, earlier. And so this is a way that you can deliver um, the, the medication to where you need it, which is in the, brain, uh, in the spinal cord um, and nervous system. Now, I think the hard thing about any sort of surgical device is one, surgery, two, having a device that's there um, that can have its own mechanical issues. Um, and so you really need to, you know, I think with providers, um, have thoughtful providers that, you know, decide whether this is a, a good option, but knowing that there's gonna be a commitment to getting the uh, baclofen pump refilled um, and coming in for adjustments and monitoring closely for complications. Um, but the nice thing about baclofen is that baclofen addresses both your dystonia and spasticity. And so that's why often it gets used um, so much from an oral standpoint and then can become a surgical option if needed. 
So the other surgical option that we have for dystonia is deep brain stimulation. So deep brain stimulation is a surgery. So in this surgery, you have electrodes that go into the brain in the area of the brain where the bad signal is coming out, and it essentially jams the signal. And so you're able to kind of stop that dystonic episode from happening. And it works really well. Again, it is a surgery, you know, has its risks as well. But the nice thing about the DBS is that once you put it in, if the tone changes or the dystonia kind of comes back, we're able to program the DBS in the office with just an iPad. And so we can kind of change the settings to keep up with the tone. So if people change over time, we're able to kind of just program it and kind of, you know, get back to their baseline. So it's really nice. Um, it's not a cure, but it does improve quality of life. And we use this for a multitude of things in movement disorder, but um, we're using it a lot for dystonia, especially for kind of the full body. It really works well. And I think there is some data that might be coming out that shows younger patients may have a better outcome. And if you think of that, it's usually because, you know, they're able to maintain their stretching and their movements, and so they're able to exercise and have physical therapy, and they don't have all of those complications down the line if they're able to move a little bit better for a, a long, from a younger age. So I think for NBIA disorders, just in general, DBS, I think, has had mixed results. There are some, uh, for some patients, it, it has helped, and others that it hasn't. I think one thing that someone had alluded to at some, one of the other um, talks we were doing was, you know, are we waiting maybe too long where we're in crisis mode and then we're trying to implant potentially a stimulator to help at that crisis moment? And so that's where I, you know, I think the technology is getting better. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot to suggest that there may be a, a better time to do it, not at the very end but maybe earlier, and we've seen some of that come from even Parkinson's disease, where people were putting a DBS stimulator at the end stages of Parkinson's, and we didn't see that it was helping as much, and so we realized, well, maybe we need to consider it a little bit sooner. Um, so there's a lot still to be learned, but I think there is better technology, and I think it is more uh, friendly for children to be able to have these implantable devices. But I think the other thing for deep brain stimulation is really figuring out, this is why it's very important for us to figure out what type of tone it is, because it works very good for dystonia and rigid tone, and it's not as helpful for spastic tone, so just figuring out what kind of tone it is really helps us decide if this is a good option or would be beneficial to your, to your loved one. And the other thing too is if you have complex movements like chorea or athetosis, that's also one that can look similar to dystonia but is different and that tends to not respond as well to DBS. But I put this article in, in particular because I wanted to let you all know that there's a lot of work going into uh, looking at you know, dyskinetic movement. So this is movements not only dystonia but with choreoathetosis as well. So some movements that we can see in um, NBIA. And this was, it's a very small study, um, but I think it's important because it's telling us that there may be other parts of the brain that we can potentially stimulate um, that may be beneficial to our patients. So if you think back, we were talking about the cerebellum, the back part of the brain. There's actually some discussion of whether you stimulate the cerebellum as a pathway that could maybe help with these hyperkinetic movements. Um, and so I think there needs to be more trials, but I think people are looking for new locations that you could potentially stimulate or modulate the brain in, in ways that we've seen in other conditions that may be helpful. So now we're gonna kind of move on to spasticity treatment. So again, we kind of talk about the medications that we use. Um, and the targets that we use. So for spasticity, we tend to use baclofen. Again, it works for dystonia and for spastic tone. The other one that we use a lot is called dantrolene. This is another muscle relaxer that works postsynaptically to, in, uh, to help inhibit the skeletal muscles. And then again, we use the, bot the botulinum toxin for different types of spastic tone. And then we have other procedures. We have phenol injections. So Botox works on the muscle to help the muscle to stop contracting, and then phenol injections work on the nerve to help it to stop firing so the muscle can calm down. And then we have other procedures, neuronectomy procedures, which Dr. Tucker might talk about more. Yeah, I think this is an interesting one. I've started to see that in the um, patients that have cerebral palsy, for spasticity in particular, um, there's a procedure called a selective dorsal rhizotomy. 
Some of you all may have heard this procedure along the way. It's typically not indicated if you have dystonia and um, spasticity with dystonia being the more uh, severe kind of uh, movement issue. You don't wanna use it. But what they're learning is, is that, like we were talking about, there's focal areas where we're seeing a lot of tone. It's like doing a uh, incision on that peripheral, that nerve that controls that muscle. Um, you're able to basically cut the input, um, output that's there. Um, and I know I'm sort of talking in, in terms that may be a little bit confusing, but what I wanted to say is that there may be ways that we can uh, treat some of this more focally. Um, and so this is something to look out for as maybe possibilities that can be used um, for, for certain patients that may be helpful. And then the baclofen pump like we talked about. So then the last, the last tone that we talk about are the Parkinsonism or the rigidity. So Parkinson isn't, so Parkinson's disease is its own entity, but you can have Parkinsonism, which is just the symptoms of, and that can be from a multitude of things. And so some of the things that we see when we talk about Parkinsonism, we can see tremor, the slowness of movement, difficulty with balance and coordination, and then muscle stiffness as rigidity, so a different type of muscle stiffness. And this is usually due to loss of dopamine-containing neurons. Um, and not everyone with Parkinsonism has Parkinson's disease. We all know that. So you can have a problem with too little dopamine or you can have a problem where the dopamine works in the brain where it's not, there's not enough receptor. So either way you can have Parkinsonism and we treat it all the same. You know, it all responds to the same, to the same treatments. We just have to try and figure out what exactly it is. So for the treatments for rigidity, we're gonna go straight to the source, right? We're gonna go to dopamine. So we have dopamine medications that are actually levodopa that turns into dopamine in the brain, and that's Cinemet or Carbidopa levodopa. Comes in a different bunch of different varieties. And then we also have dopamine-like medications, which are nice because they have long-acting formulations that last 24 hours. There's pills, there's a patch, there are, there are ones that you can inhale now, there are ones that you can have nose sprays, there's ones that you can do shots to just try and get people out of these stuck type of conditions. Um, so there's a bunch of different dopamine agonists. And then we have other type of um, ones that are inhibitors. So we have MAOB inhibitors, which help to just keep the, help slow down the breakdown of dopamine in your brain so your dopamine can stay around longer and work. And then we have COMP inhibitors that help the levodopa stay as levodopa in your system so it can cross the blood-brain barrier and turn into dopamine. So we have a lot of those and we actually have a couple of new ones. And then we have other medications. Amantadine is a very interesting medication. It's actually, it was an antiviral at the beginning and it's found to have some dopamine qualities. It's also pretty activating. So some people use it as a stimulant and then it also gives you some dopamine properties. And then we have the anticholinergics which help with tone. So the trihexyphenidyl, artane, benztropine. There's overlap in all of these three kind of tone conditions, but they, they all can kind of help on certain types of tone. Again, those ones are a little bit harder to use just because the limiting factor of the sedation. So we have to try to balance those out. And this was just kind of a, to show where the dopamine works. So you can either work where, you know, the presynaptically where you have dopamine in the neuron and then you have places in the middle where it tries to keep that dopamine around longer to flood the receptors. And then we have, we have, sorry, I'm sorry. Then we have medications that work on the other side that actually where the dopamine receptor is, it helps that movement to go. So there's just different places where these dopamine targets are. So they're just kind of all over that, that area. And then what we usually see with dopamine medications is people talk about on time or off time. So when the medication works, it kicks in, it's nice and quick, lasts for a couple of hours and then it kind of wears off. And that's kind of the phenomenon of dopamine. And so we try to make that on time as long as possible by using long acting medications and better formulations that just allow people to have a longer on time where they can move properly and be awake and feel better. So in summary, uh, you know, there are a lot of different movement disorders that we can see in NBIA. These movements, I think what's important, can evolve and change over time. Uh, you know, the goal with uh, medications is that we want to help impact the quality of life. Um, so it's really important for us as physicians to work with uh, families and loved ones to figure out which ones are the most beneficial with the least amount of side effects. Um, and, you know, we're still continuing. I hope, you know, you, uh, you all were able to see. We know a lot, but we still have so much to learn. 
Um, and so I think as we understand these pathways better, and as we understand how each gene in the MBIA disorders plays a role in these pathways, it will help us to potentially come up with better medications that target um, really some of the symptoms that we can see in the NBIA disorders. So that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We do have about 10 minutes for questions, if the speakers would like to respond to any questions from audience members. Oh, that's good. So I think uh, the question was the impact of traditional physical therapy. So 100% therapies are so important. Um, you know, we focused a lot on the medicines because I know a lot of families have questions about what are the medicines, but absolutely it's so important um, for physical occupational speech therapy. Those are probably the things that I start off with as the first thing for all of our families. It's important, we know in a lot of neurodegenerative conditions, to keep moving. Movement is so important. And so that is definitely something that we encourage and should definitely be done um, from the get-go. Yeah, and a lot of these interventions allow you to be able to participate in physical therapy better. And that's one of the benefits that we see with DBS is that, you know, you're able to move, so you're able to do the physical therapy better. So. While we don't, I meant to say this at the end, while we don't have you know, specific treatments for all of the movement disorders, it's just that we look at all the movements within the disorders that we do see, and that's how we're coming up with treatments for other things. So you know, that, I think that's important. Like, there's a lot of research being done on Parkinson's and other movement disorders, and from that, we're gonna gather so much more information to be able to treat all of these other movements that we see. But physical therapy is key to all of it. I mean, I think dystonic storm, it's a great question. So is dystonic storm a, uh, a progression of the disease or is it a response to pain or stressors? And so I think that that's kind of a complex question where it's, it's both. So it can progress, but anytime, when our movement disorder patients have kind of a, an active um, storm of any sort, we try to figure out what's wrong. There's usually something wrong that's sparking it. Are they in pain? Are they sick? Is there something else that's going on that's making their system not be able to handle their normal movements? And so I think that dystonic storm, yes, is a progression, but if it's seen out of the blue, then we need to find out what the underlying problem, what's happening, something's changed. And we see that a lot. So I've seen, so I, I see a lot of Parkinson patients since I'm adult movement, and we do see this transcranial stim a lot. Um, it's, it's, I think it's evolving, um, it's become helpful, it's kind of activating the neurons that are kind of not, not acting the right way and trying to synchronize them. So I think it has its role for certain movements. I think that's going to be an evolving treatment because it's non-invasive, um, it's not really harmful, though we do have to caution people who have seizures. Um, so I think that that's coming. I'm not, I don't know how much you see about it in the, in the pediatric population. I think it's a lot that families are asking about some of these other options. And typically what I end up saying is let's see, you know, with the adults or older <laughs> folks first before, you know, the younger ones. Um, but I think it's definitely something um, that, you know, there, there, there may be some role for it um, in the future. I think one question I was gonna ask to Dr. Boyle, we were talking about what were some of the questions you'd get asked. But CBD, I would, no one's asked about CBD. Um, but that's, that's one that we get asked all the time. Um, so I'd love to kind of see what. Yeah, um, so it just got approved in the state of Texas for medicinal use for Parkinson's and spasticity. So I have a lot of patients that ask about it. Um, I have a lot of patients that have tried it. So they've tried the over-the-counter uh, CBD before. That's the, you know, that's over, everybody, anybody can get that CBD. And I don't have as many good luck stories with that, but people who are on the actual medical marijuana, they have really improved. It helps tone, it helps pain. I do have a couple of pediatrics that have, you know, aged out and come to me in, at CP with dystonia, acetoic urea, all of these things, and they do feel better. So I think there's gonna be a role for this more in the future. 
I think it's, it's more regulated now, so the stuff that you get from the state is actually pretty pure and regulated and you know what you're getting. So really, I've had pretty good success so far with my patients. So I think that's coming. Yeah, and I think one of the things that physicians will say is, you know, we still don't know a lot of what is the impact of um, CBD on the brain. I think we're learning. Um, you know, epilepsy and epidiolex has really taught um, a lot of physicians about it. I think the ne next big step is knowing that when you get this, uh, the CBD, that you're getting what you're supposed to be getting. And that's the part right now that I think is still right. missing. Yes, sir. So that's, that's kind of part of the whole CBD. You know, when, when people get, so it's interesting because when I, when I had first looked into it, I really thought that the CBD had most of the medicinal qualities. It's anti-inflammatory, it helps with pain. But when I talk to patients who have used the hemp CBD, which is, you know, the, the other, not the marijuana plant, it has naturally higher CBD and low to no THC. And I was really thinking that they would get a benefit from that. And I really have not heard that. People don't seem to respond as well to that. But the medical ma marijuana, it does have THC in it. And they seem to actually do better with a little bit of a higher percentage of THC. It's still higher CBD, but they still need that THC. So I think time's going to tell why is this happening, you know, why, what is going on in the brain that that works. But I've definitely had a better response with medical marijuana versus the hemp. And I think it's the THC that's causing that difference but still a lot more research to be done. <laughs> Let the adults come first. Most of them are, are like hard candies. They have um, under the tongue oils or they have like the lozenges, and so most of my patients use either one of those two. Um, I don't think in the state of Texas, I don't think they do like vape or smoke. I think it's mostly the trophies or whatever the lozenges are called and then the, the oil, because some people, if they have a feeding tube, they have to use the oil. But I, you know, again, like I said, we have to kind of tread with, with caution and, and guidance. So just, you know, keep that in mind. Thank you both. Thank you both and thank to the audience for your, for your, for your questions. Patty? I have 